With the presidential elections coming up, immigration is a key issue once again, and the debate is heightened by the chaotic situation at the border, as evidenced by President Biden's State of the Union address and the Republican response to it. An allegedly big part of the solution to the border crisis, the long-awaited uh, bipartisan Senate uh, bipartisan uh, border deal, fell in the Senate, and there seems to be no solution to this crisis in sight. But do either Democrats or Republicans really care about solving the immigration crisis? This is what we'll discuss today in New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Agustina Vergara Cid, and with me is Onkar Gatte. So Onkar, let's dive right in. So I think that a big part um, of what the failed bipartisan border deal shows is that there is no interest from either party to solve the immigration crisis. Uh, I think not only because it actually failed in the Senate, despite, despite the fact that it was negotiated by both parties, but I think also because of the content of the deal. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I think this deal, like while it might have helped in the short term to manage numbers at the border a little bit, it is not what it looks like to seriously be thinking about immigration policy and solving actually this crisis for good and for the long term. So what do you think it looks like to think about immigration seriously? And what should the immigration system prioritize? Yeah, so I was I was away at the State of the Union, so I didn't watch it live, but I watched it afterwards. And one of the things that I thought was interesting that it is one of the reasons to have this podcast is how anti-immigrant Biden's rhetoric in the State of the Union was. And I think of that as it's anti-American that and, and you can look back to some of what he said when he assumed the presidency in 2021. It's more positive towards immigration, that America is a country of immigrants. Some of what he proposed wasn't all good, but some of what he proposed was um, trying to help people to work in the U.S. And I think that the essential in terms of thinking about the U.S., as a political cause is that America is based on an idea. It's based on a new view of government, a new view of the rights of the individual, and that government now is just a means and a servant of the individual to secure his rights. It's based on an idea. And if it's based on an idea, it means it's open to everybody. It's not just for the people who happen to be, live in America or be born in America. It's an idea that anybody can share in. And in that sense, America should be seen as it's welcoming of people from around the world who want to embark on the project or the experiment, which is America, who are attracted by this idea that they're welcome and that we want them to come to America. And that, that the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of this. It beckons to the world, to people yearning to breathe free. Is one of the, that like that's what you can do in America, and if that's what you want to do, you're welcome in America. And now we've got on, I think, on both sides, the that it's the stance is no, you're not really welcome to come to America. And like yearning to breathe free means you're yearning to make something of your own life. You're going to you're going to be able to make something of it in America that you couldn't do in so many other places in the world. And the essential of that means I'm going to build a life. And to do that, you have to be able to work and have a career. And that's why like, what one thinks about when people coming to America, it's they want to build something. And so which means they have to be free to build, free to work. And a proper immigration policy would be oriented around that. And so anybody who's interested in uh, it's true that immigration, it's, like it's a disaster today, but anyone who's interested in reforming it in a pro-American way, the essence of what they should be thinking about and the, the kind of whole focus should be, how do we make it easier for people who want to work, who are peaceful and just want to build a better life? How do we make it easier for them 
to come to America and to do that. And if that's not what you're focused on, you're not focused on reforming the immigration system in a pro-American way. I agree with that, Ankar. And I think it's also, so it's not just from the perspective, let's say, of the immigrant, but also I think that it's the, the system as it is right now, it also violates the rights of Americans because they're not free to associate with whoever, associate with whoever they want, to welcome to their home whoever they want, and to hire whoever they want. And part of what, like, frankly, I don't, at this point, I don't expect, expect politicians to be thinking in principles and to be thinking about really an, an American immigration system and what that should look like. I've been very disappointed in the past thinking that they would think something like that. But one thing that also gets my attention, like I, I found, I find kind of like surprising is that they're not even thinking about it from kind of like a pragmatic point of view, if that makes sense. So it's not even that they're like, okay, look, we have all these employers who need workers and Americans are not wanting to do those jobs or they just, they're not, and there are, there are more jobs available than there are people uh, that want to take those jobs. And so th at least at the very least, I think that the perspective should be, look, let's allow more immigrants to come here to work. Let's make it easier for them to work, to fill these jobs for these American employers. That is like a very like pragmatical, pragmatic way to think about it. But I don't think that's even what either Republicans or Democrats are thinking about it. Not even that, which seems like such an obvious benefit of letting people come here to work, like such an obvious benefit for America and for American employers, it would be such a benefit. Like they're not even thinking about that. Yes, and you can't walk around in American cities and not see all kinds of help wanted signs. Um, and it's both, it, it, like it's a, at least at both ends, if not the whole spectrum, but of low skilled workers, that there's plenty of American companies who say we want to hire, we could expand our production, but to do that, we need to be able to deal freely with foreigners. And right now the system doesn't allow them to deal freely. They, they can find people willing to take the positions and so on. And the immig our immigration policy prevents them from doing that. And it's the same on the issue of high skilled uh, work. I mean, a lot of the tech companies and, and I mean, it's true in medicine, they talk about, well, we've got shortages of high skilled, uh, high, highly skilled people. And it's, again, the immigration system makes it impossible for them to uh, hire these people that some of them they would have to hire as foreigners. And again, in terms of thinking about Biden now versus Biden when he assumed office, he was more willing to talk about some of those issues when he assumed office in, in part of the uh, of an immigration bill that he sent to Congress right at the start. It talked about, well, let's make it easier for foreign students who are studying at U.S. universities to then work in the U.S. after and not kick them out and they have to go home. And again, like that's at the highly skilled level. And he would talk about some, whether how sincere he was about this is what I want to do and this is the kind of policies, changes that I think we need, he was at least willing to talk about, like, this is part of what is America is about. And when you watch the State of the Union um, address for, I mean, so, so you know, a few weeks ago, so that's from 2021 to 2024, it's, he's so much on the defensive that it's, that, I mean, many analysts think this is the issue on which Biden and the Democrats are most vulnerable that and so you could see him in the state of the union address it's oh no I I don't want immigrants either and I'm going to help close the border and and the, and that is the the that is such a shift away from what the America should be doing and it, again as you said it doesn't you're not going to get a fundamental reform, I think, but you could still get some of these things that would make it easier to work in the U.S., um, both for lower skilled and higher skilled. Uh, and it, as you said, it, it's an issue not just from the immigrants' perspective, but it's an issue. It's a violation of the, these companies and individuals in America who want to work with and deal with in a peaceful way foreigners 
the immigration system prevents them from doing it. Yeah, and I'll add that Biden has, I mean, the immigration system already, like pre-Biden, obviously, makes it really hard for people to come here to work. There are other things that are prioritized. It is a very restrictive system. But Biden has made it harder for a lot of people to, for a lot of, of U.S. employers to hire foreign workers. I recently talked to people who are involved in the uh, seasonal worker programs, so the H-2A and H-2B visa programs. And they were telling me that after Biden took office, that so many regulations have been passed that make it so hard for them to get the workers that they want. And we're talking about temporary workers, so seasonal workers, for example, in agriculture that would come here for six months, nine months, and then work the field and then go back home to their home countries uh, and take their earnings uh, home and then maybe come back next year. Uh, but Biden is making it really hard for uh, for these workers to do those jobs. And it can't even be the excuse, you know, how people like to say they take our jobs type thing, because in agriculture, no Americans are doing those jobs. They did just they don't show up to work. Um, part of it is I was talking to to this to this farmer and he, he gave a talk at an event I was at and he was saying he hired something like I don't know how many Americans like two showed up for work and only one stayed throughout the, the, the entire season. So not even from that perspective, they're not thinking about it. And I think that it's not only crucial to think about it because it's having more people coming here to work is respectful of individual rights, the individual rights of migrants, but also the individual rights of Americans, but also kind of like, because the moral is a practical, I think that a lot of the issues currently going on at the at the southern border would be fixed or at least dramatically reduced by allowing more legal immigration more workers coming here uh, to to engage in, with american employers i think it would address most of the biggest concerns or alleged concerns about immigration like welfare well if they come here to work first of all the welfare like they have immigrants have very little restrictive access but if they come here to work they have no need for welfare uh, the issue of vetting and uh vetting for national security threats and for criminality that also can be done in a much more thorough way when people apply for visas in their home countries and there's time for that vetting to 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 happen and when people can come here legally and, and orderly, they choose to do so. And we have evidence that it has worked in the past. And it would decrease, dramatically decrease uh, the border chaos because people would no longer need to show up to you know, seek asylum, even though like a lot of people showing up at the border are seeking asylum, even though they are what they're called e economic migrants. They come here for the opportunity, not necessarily because they're being, you know, uh, persecuted by gangs or or by government or their own governments. So I think a lot of the answer to this, and it seems rather pretty like it seems pretty straightforward. I mean, I'm not a genius realizing this, and the people uh, you know pushing this is that, that it's very obvious. So I think part of it is that we've seen the success that some of Biden's to Biden's credit, the parole programs that he's implemented, which are not um framed as work programs, right? So the parole programs uh, that Biden implemented was there's a select number of countries where uh, an American an American or permanent resident in the US can sponsor people to come here and they help them settle, they help them, they help them get a job and uh, adapt and, and assimilate to the American society. And these uh, migrants, these immigrants get uh, two years to, to, to live here and they uh, get a work permit and they can, you know, stand on their own two feet and start building, trying to build a life here in America. And this has had, these programs have had a lot of, a lot of success in reducing the number of illegal border crossings from the nationalities that, that uh, were involved in this program, like Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans, the numbers radically declined once these programs went into effect. And I believe we have a, a chart here that shows that. Here we go. So you see in uh, 
the one that says Cuban, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans arrested uh, crossing illegally. So you can see how the numbers dramatically decrease once these uh, parole programs went into place. And then uh, one of the other nations that benefited from this was uh, Ukraine. So with the war, there were there's a lot of asylum seekers from Ukraine es escaping the war. So this graph, what it shows is how, where have Ukraine's been entering the United States since the parole uh, pro sponsorship program started? So you can see that uh, before the program started, they were showing up at the border. And once the, the parole program began, they, sh they started showing up at, at, at airports because they can go from Ukraine directly to the city that wherever their sponsor is. So that is one way to decongest the border as well. And this also, I think, shows that the number of people that are sponsoring immigrants or, or potential immigrants, I think also shows that Americans are willing to, like, they don't have that much of a problem with immigrants dealing individually. And Onkar, you told me something very interesting uh, that I hadn't thought about. It's more in the collectivist level that this anti-immigrant immigrant rhetoric is mostly used. Yeah, so I, I think one of the significant things about the Ukrainian immigration, if you read what happened after Russia invaded Ukraine, it's easy to look at the political situation and look at what Democrats and Republicans are saying and think that they reflect the mood of the country, that the mm -hmm. country and Americans as individuals are pretty anti-immigrant, or at least a majority of them are anti-immigrant. We need uh, more border walls. We need to keep more people out, deport more people, send them home. Whereas when you, when Americans at an individual level deal with other Americans or other immigrants and foreigners. It's not like, oh, okay, I'm happy to deal with an American, but don't have me deal with a foreigner or an immigrant. It's at an individual level, they can make a distinction between, yeah, I don't want to deal with an American or an immigrant who's a criminal, but if they're hard working and trying to make something of their lives, I'm interested in dealing with them and it doesn't really matter if they're American, have American citizenship or they don't. So at an individual level, it's, yeah, like I'm pro good people and I'm not pro people who aren't good. And an American can make that distinction and thinks of it like that. So, and and it's why they would welcome Ukrainians so that they can see that, yeah, your country's been invaded by a dictator. I might want to flee too if that's what's happening here. And so, and that at an individual level, yeah, I can understand why you're trying to get out of Ukraine and I'll help sponsor that and help you get on your feet. And they also think of it as, yeah, you're not coming here to get now you're going to be on the welfare system for two years. It's yeah, we're going to help you out. But what helping you out makes it that you can then learn and be able to stand on your own two feet. And it's I mean, there's nothing distinctive about Ukrainians in that regard versus immigrants coming from other countries who really want to build something. And so at an individual level, I don't think most Americans are anti-immigration, but what the this is part of what's so bad about what the politicians are doing and it's both parties are doing this it's what they're doing is stoking fear of immigration and immigrants and making it yeah they're the ones who you should be suspicious of fear they're the source of your problems if only we could keep them out um that you your your life would somehow be better off even though at an individual level Americans don't know when, like, if we keep good people out, that my life wouldn't be better if, if that's what we're doing. And so you have, there's a, a weird kind of schizophrenia, I think, for Americans. At an individual level, it's they're not anti-immigrant, but they're being pushed more and more in politically that I should be um, anti-immigrant. And so you watch people being interviewed, and it's people like in the middle of the country, not close to a border, they're not a border town like many of the border towns are real messes and i'm completely understand that people will think yeah like something has to be done and we it, and it, and you either have to reduce the flow or you have to process it in a different kind of way because what's happening now is a disaster at many of the borders towns and and places but if you're in the middle of the country in ohio and it's 
like it, when they, they ask people, uh, potential voters, like what's the biggest issues on your mind? And it's often the two are inflation, which is certainly understandable, and the border. And they're not affected at an individual level by what's happening at the border. And if they've benefited a lot from immigration and being able to deal just freely with other people, Americans and non-citizens, and yet they are, they've been taught that, oh yeah, this should be at the top of my agenda. This is like a huge problem. Our country's falling apart. Uh, we won't have a country anymore. And, so, and they, they've succumbed to that, but they don't actually believe it, I think, at an individual level. I do think, though, that there is this concern among many people that there is no rule of law and there's like some lawlessness going on at the at the border. Uh, which I I went to uh, McAllen, Texas, to one of of the of the sectors uh, across the border, and it is uh, there's a lot of lawlessness, uh, and I think there's like this concern that the system that we have right now is not uh, not doing what it's supposed to do, and it's endangering kind of like the the rest of the country by letting in certain people that shouldn't be let in because. The system is overwhelmed. What do you make of that position? Yeah, I, so yeah, there are a lot of valid concerns about what is happening on the border. And I think the widest and most fundamental is that it brings into question the rule of law. If you have laws on the books and the citizenry thinks, yeah, the government couldn't care about enforcing these and so that breeds a contempt for the law that I think is very bad. So there are real problems here. But to say that Americans, that at least my view is like the majority of Americans at an individual level are not anti-immigrant and anti-immigration means they would be open to a solution that emphasized, yeah, peaceful people who want to work here and so on, we welcome it. It's not just like, oh, we grudgingly will take them in. We welcome people like that. And I think Americans still are welcoming. So they would be open to a solution that actually moves in an American direction. That's pro work, pro the individual, pro freedom. And so part of the tragedy is that neither party will take a stand like that. And so could attract Americans who are rightly think that our current immigration policies and procedures, including the lack of law enforcement, is a problem and a real problem. But they would be um, open, I think, to better solutions. And But the politicians, instead of playing to the better side of Americans, they're playing to the worst side and they're stoking the fears. And you can see that both, uh, and we probably should turn to that now, but and both in Biden's State of the Union address and then, like, I saw that and I thought, this is bad. And then the Republican response is even worse in regard to immigration. And that, it, it's, you're, you're appealing to people's, the worst in people um, and stoking fears and fear of the other. And what they should be doing is um, speaking to the best of what Americans are. And as I say, I think still at an individual level, most Americans are open and welcoming to anybody who they view as, yeah, you're hardworking, you want to, you're peaceful, you want to make something of your life. You're, you're in effect like me. And that's part of what, that America's an idea and not it's, oh, you look a little different or you speak different. That doesn't actually bother Americans at an individual level, I think. Let's turn to the to Biden's State of the Union and more broadly what how the Democrats are talking about immigration now, which I agree with what you said earlier, there's this shift towards being more anti-immigrant. So let's play the first clip that we have uh, on the border on the State of the Union. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? 
I'll be darned. That's amazing. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges help tackle the backload of two million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now. What are you against? 100 more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's killing thousands of children. This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. It would also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is — yeah, yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know — I know you know how to read. I believe that, given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate, would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. Uh, okay, so uh, there's a lot to unpack there, Onkar. But one of the things that kind of like stands out about the these um, these clip is the Democrats giving a standing ovation for uh, what Biden calls it the toughest set of border security reforms or something like that. So uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, so I think I think that's that's the major takeaway that there's a pivot that he's doing and that the Democrats are supporting that this is the supposedly an issue on which the Democrats are most vulnerable. And there's real reasons to criticize what Biden has done. We've talked a little bit of some of them. And as you said, he's made it diff more difficult for people to come and work in the U.S. But instead of taking it, yeah, OK, we've got a problem in regard to immigration. What would be better immigration policy? Um, and as we've talked about, it, that would be thinking about how do we make it easier for hardworking, peaceful people to come work in the U.S., remain in the U.S.? He, that's not what he's focused on. The whole focus here is look how tough I am on immigrants, immigration. I'm going to make the border secure, but secure here means going to keep out people. That, that, that's the emphasis, that we're going to keep out people. And so the, the, the switch is to try to make it, look, we're the ones who are tough on immigration, making it hard to, to get into the country. And you Republicans who say that's what you want to do, when you're actually presented with a bill, you then refuse to endorse it or even, I mean, and, and there might be some truth to this, that some of them were going to support it until Trump was, no, I don't want you to support it because this is a winning issue for us if there remains chaos on the, if, or if it's seen as the border remains chaotic, then that is going to make it more likely for us to be elected. And that in itself is a form of scare mongering like let's keep people scared so they'll vote for us um but the, the, it's so that's what the democrats are pivoting to and what biden in the state of the union addresses that's what i think he's singling and it, it's like it's moving further away from a, from an american approach to immigration and it it's i mean from that perspective it's really bad Yes. And yeah, like you said, like the things he chose to emphasize about the, the border deal is more enforcement, more enforcement and like make it harder to apply for, for migrants to apply for asylum, which is what he means when he says he's going to shut down the border, which is technically not not true, but it's it makes him appear really tough on immigration to say that he's going to shut down the border. Uh, but to think that he, that is what he chose to highlight. I'm not saying that the, the, the bill is, is good or, I mean, to make it clear, more ICE agents, more asylum judges, 
uh, more immigration judges, more asylum officers, that would all help. Like, uh, in, like border patrol is really overwhelmed right now at the border. Would, more agents would would help. It would you know alleviate a little bit of the situation. And the asylum process is taking five to seven years, which is completely unacceptable. Uh, but he chose to highlight that and the more enforcement, more cracking down. The bill has a couple aspects that uh, like span, expand uh, legal immigration a little bit, more uh, green cards for family and, and, and work, uh, work-based work and family-based green cards. There's a, an expedited like, a process for Afghan refugees. There's uh, other measures that have been, have been, a problem before that this bill would have fixed. But what he chose to highlight is we're going to be really, really tough on immigration. We're cracking down. So that maybe even like not just, I think, 2021, maybe six months ago or a year ago, I would have been really, really surprised to hear from a from a Democrat. Uh, yes. Uh, and and even, just saying something about the asylum. Um, I mean, you brought this up before that there's the, the idea that asylum is a respectable reason to come into the country, but economic migration isn't, that the when you're activating, oh, it's asylum, yeah, we need to process that and so on. What we should be more concerned with is the people who want to come here. To, and economic migration means yeah and even my life might be okay in some other place but i could it could be so much better if i came to the us i could uh, work in the field i want to work and build a career and that's a really good motivation and should not be cast dispersion on and even for asylum the crucial thing is not oh you're persecuted in your other country it's the only reason to grant asylum like to think of this as yeah, th this is a reason to come. It's that you view what's being done to you in another country as unjust. It's so people persecute Ukrainians persecuted or Russians who oppose Putin and being persecuted, or people in China opposing the dictatorship who are persecuted, and that they seek asylum in the U.S. It's I w we should have our arms open for these people, but not because they're persecuted. It's because they won't stand for the persecution and want to do something about it that they think it's not right and I won't live this way. And that that's the similarity to economic migration. It's, yeah, I want a better life than this. And that's the reason to be open and welcoming for them. And in that sense, it's, they're similar. And the idea that, oh, yeah, if you're really downtrodden, persecuted, then America might have a place for you. But if you just want a better life, well, no, we, we, we're going to close our borders to that. And that's part of also what Biden's activating. And there, the whole speech was very anti-business um, in various kinds of ways. So that the, he's going to be um, open for economic migration. It's that, and particularly for low skilled, because he's also sees himself as he's the pro-union president. Mm -hmm. And like even when he, when you read things that he was saying in 2021, so right when he assumed office, it's um, he was protectionist in regard to anything that would be thought of as it might, um, the unions might not like this, and the unions will tend to low skilled, we don't like that competition, highly skilled, um, there are some unions that would, but he's, he tends to be like more the automotive unions of people who are they are not actually low skilled, but will be thought of like that. So he won't bring up that issue, and it's conspicuous that that's he's not bringing that up. Um, but that's the essence, as we've talked about. That's the essence of if you're really thinking of what it would be to have an American, more American approach, you would think of that as that's a positive motivation, not a motivation to be suspicious of. And another issue that. Uh, is very prominent in the immigration debate is criminality among the the immigrant population. It, it's always been an, an issue that people hang on to to try to limit immigration.
but it's become especially contentious lately with migrants who have been paroled into the country. So let's take a look at Biden talking about the murder of Lake and Riley. We have another clip. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner. Not really. I. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? Uh, a little bit of context for those who might not have heard about this case. It's uh, Lakin Riley was a 22 year old nursing student who was murder, murdered in Georgia in on February 22nd of this year. And uh, the suspect, um, Jose Barra, a Venezuelan who was paroled into the United States, I believe in 2022, uh, well, he was arrested for this murder. So. Um, Onkar, what do you make of uh, Biden's remarks and the way that he handled this uh, case in the State of the Union? Well, if you, if you take seriously what he said, it's pretty bad. Um, whether this is what he meant exactly, but what he said is, um, yes, this per I mean, so this person is a suspect, but if it, if it turns out that this person is the murderer, this is someone who is an illegal immigrant they, they, in the country, not with authorization or permission. And his response was, yeah, but how many people are killed by legals? And if you take legal and illegal as referring to immigrants, so there's illegal immigrants and legal immigrants, then his retort is, well, how many immigrants who are here lawfully have killed people? And then it like all that does is stokes the person who's anti-immigrant. Well, do we have to keep them all out, illegal or, or legal? There shouldn't be legal immigrants in the country. Um, and this is so it's he didn't bring this up in the speech. He's being heckled by uh, Major Marjorie Taylor Greene about this. And so and you can think of it. It's a kind of competition. Who's going to be more anti-immigrant? And it's. So he's trying to say he's strong on closing the borders and it, he's being heckled. Well, but you let this person in and this person committed, or at least is, is a suspect and is alleged to have committed murder. Um, so how can you say you're tough on immigration? And his response is a non-response or worse than a non-response that like anybody in listening to the, the debate will be, well, like, isn't that an argument that we have to keep out immigrants legal or illegal? Um, but the fact that this is being used and the way that it's being used is it, it shows you this is part of that there's a kind of uh, fear mongering here. And then in the Republican response, as we'll talk about, it's even worse than what happens in the state of the union. But the, the immigration policy can't hinge on, um, well, if we let in immigrants, none will have to commit a crime. If one commits a crime, then it is, okay, well, that, that's, we shouldn't have immigration. And the, you, you did a podcast, uh, I think with Ben a few weeks, or maybe it, it's a month ago now, where you brought up DeSantis's remark, this is when he was still vying for the Republican nomination and so there too like within the republican candidates there was a lot of vying for who's the most restrictive on immigration and he brought up the um the, the linking of terrorists coming over the border and what was happening in israel hamas and it was th th he said something like this that it was well it's just if you do the math and it's 7 million people coming in, I think that his number was something like 7 million people coming in. Um, some of them are going to commit terrorist attacks. and uh, But if you brought in that, to, it's some other criminal attack. That's true from a statistical point of view that it, like, it's statistically likely of the 7 million people, there's some subset who are, and let's leave aside the terrorism, but will commit crimes. 
but that's as true of Americans. Um, and so, and you wouldn't have this perspective that like maybe government should control births in the country, like who can have kids and so because like there's all these mothers or families all over the place. And if 7 million of these, one of them will be a mass shooter. And I mean, there's been a lot of mass shooters or uh, American citizens born in America. And so, and but that's not an argument that, well, government should control um, birth rates in the country. And yet the like, people here and they think, oh, well, but it's an immigrant. So that, like, doesn't that tell us something? It doesn't tell you anything. Um, it tells you something about the person um, and that they're a vile person. And, and it can tell you something about what's broken about the system if we don't have any kind of vetting and so on. And indeed, what part of what we've done, if you if um, you would think that if your system is geared to keeping people out who want to work, if you're just looking at the proportions of the people coming in, there might be a higher element than otherwise would have existed of criminality of because the people who are hardworking, who will follow the rules, who don't like will question like, do I really want to come in illegally? Do I want to break the law to come in? The person in um, in Norway or take the take a situation that's far worse than that in Hong Kong and what China's doing to Hong Kong um, will be, yeah, but like I would like to get in legally to America and I want to work and so on. I'm not going to do it illegally. And that invites the person who like doesn't care that it, uh, I don't care if I'm doing something illegal. So it might be, and uh, there's reason to think, not that immigrants commit all kinds of crimes and so on, but that our system keeps out peaceful people and um, in that sense, like you have a higher portion of people coming in who aren't peaceful. But that's a problem with the system, not, oh, immig immigrants are criminals or something like that. And yet it's it, that's what it's being used as. It's really being used as an argument, oh, we should keep out immigrants. Right. To me, these sort of things is not an argument for keeping out immigrants, but for expanding legal immigration and allow, uh, like, like I said earlier, more avenues for people who are peaceful and want to work to, to do so, including because people can apply from their home countries and they can be vetted way more thoroughly than what is happening when someone shows up at the border along with a thousand other people that show up and they have to be processed on the spot and then released into the country waiting for a hearing for years and years and years. Um, but and, and also, like you said, the, the system is attracting either people who don't care about breaking the law and will do anything, and people who are extremely desperate, desperate enough that they're willing to go through all of this and go you know, through the cartels and everything that's going on and tr to try and come here and make a better life. And there is in this perspective that if you expanded the possibilities for people to come here to work, you would get people from all over the world and you would get people that like you said earlier, it's not just, okay, I can live an okay life or, a, you know, I'll be fine in Italy, in Spain, wherever, but I could be a, I could live a really, really successful, more ambitious life in the United States. Those people would also come here if it were doable, because right now it's nearly impossible to do that. And another and, thing about the, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to bring up the, the, the so, in, on this episode, the the Lincoln Riley murder, the the difference between the politicians and Americans. The, the, this is obviously a, a tragic case. Americans should object to it being politicized in this way. That rather than think of it as this is a murder committed by some heinous person, and if it if it's the suspect that they've apprehended than that by that person, but that still has to be worked out in the court of law. You, you should have a really negative attitude towards this person. What they did is evil. Um, it doesn't translate into, oh, well, all immigrants must be like this. And that that's the political use that it's been. And to use somebody's murder for political gain like this should be um, abhorrent. And the, it, it, when you read about this case, her father 
he could make this kind of distinction. And this is what I mean. Look at, I think a normal American makes this kind of decision and distinction when they're thinking at an individual level, not at a sort of what is my political gang or tribe and what am I supposed to say to be a member of this tribe? So, but just as an individual level, when you he's been interviewed now of and and he supposedly is a Trump supporter um, and and the, one of the questions he was asked is like, do you think that this would have been prevented if we had stronger or more secure border? And he said, well, I don't know, but it might. I mean, this person is a criminal, and and, and part of the backstory is that um, so both he was apprehended by police in New York and then also in Georgia and Georgia for shoplifting in a Walmart and then was let go. So you can more broadly think like being soft on crime, uh, the, like that doesn't that encourage criminals? So he was, he said maybe, and but then he also said about immigrants and, and he objected to the way that his daughter's murder is being used for political gain on both, both sides in various ways. And um, and he said, look, I can understand people who look, want to come here for economic reasons to have a better life, but th that doesn't mean we should be letting in criminals. And that's true. Like you should be able to make that distinction. And the fact that now, like what politically it's being pushed as, you have to think of all immigrants as one collective. They're all the same. And so if one commits a crime, that tells you, oh, they all must be like this. And so shouldn't we be keeping them all up? And that that's such a collectivistic um, and perverse way of looking at people. And it's not the way normal Americans look at people. And even someone like he's able to think at that level in the midst of a tragedy and of, of lo having lost his daughter. And it's the politicians should be able to live up to that. And they so, they're so dramatically failing. Yes, they are. And we're going to take a look now at how the Republicans are talking about this uh, immigration crisis. And we're going to take a look at the Republican response to the State of the Union, which was delivered by Senator Katie Britt. So we have a clip with a part of Britt's response. And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time. But minutes after taking office, he suspended all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis. He invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. OK, um, so I could not find a single metric where the her statement that Biden inherited the most secure border where I could find that to be plausibly true. In fact, what I found was that during the Trump administration, the number of people sort of like sneaking in, like the, what, what they're called gotaways, uh, between ports of entry increased pretty dramatically. So the people, it's people that are not processed, that are literally by any means like here illegally. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are coming from, what they're doing, but there's no way to keep track of them. That happened during the Trump administration, but I don't think that's necessarily what she means when she says the most secure border. What what is she trying to activate? Because there is no objective metric to back that statement. Yeah, I I take it as and if you watch the whole response, it's very pro Trump. I take what it means the inherited the most secure border. What that really means is we had a president and you could say at least in recent uh, memory the most anti-immigrant president in at least in his campaigning and his rhetoric um and it and it and he's running on we've got to build a wall to keep people out but the whole imagery of it is like there's savages and barbarians at our border 
And if we don't build a wall across the whole southern United States, they're going to swarm in and, and that's our country is going to be gone. And, and, and it's part of like make America great again is supposed to be partly that like if we the way to make it great again is to keep out these people. And so it's so not one it's, of the things that he he said that was very um, shocking, not surprising, unfortunately, but he said that immigrants are poisoning the blood of the country, too. Yes, there's a bit, he's used all kinds of dehumanizing language. I mean, when it was the when it was first elected, I mean, in that campaign, it was Mexico sending us our rape, their rapists and so on. And it was um, it, it wasn't true. Um, he knows it wasn't true. It so it, it was already like a lot of scaremongering about this and that um, th that's what she's activating, I think, is the we used to have a president who was anti uh, immigrant and anti immigration in Trump. And now so it's I mean, so it's obvious Biden's pivoting to no, look, I'm the one who's strong on actually keeping people out and strong. we're going to have the most secure uh, border reforms. He's trying to paint himself like that. So I think basically what, what it, when we you inherited the most secure border, she knows that that's not true. Um, so some of the things you've said about like what was happening during the Trump administration at the border, um, I mean, she, she well knows that. But it, what it is is, it's no, if you really want somebody anti immigrant, don't vote for Biden, vote for Trump. I think that, like, that's part of the whole atmosphere. Um, and sort of the, if you read between the lines, that's part of what the State of the Union address, I mean, the response to the State of the Union address. And this is, it's the both plane, like, it's, it's Biden trying to say, no, if you're scared of immigrants and so on, vote for me, I'll actually get something done. And it's the Republicans who are stalling. And it, the response is, no, like if you're really anti-immigrant, you've got to vote for us. And it, it's, as I said, this this is part of what it looks like, that the appeal is to the worst elements in Americans, not to the best, which is, which is that they are actually welcoming of hardworking immigrants. Yes, th this has turned a comp into a competition over who's uh, most awful on immigration. Um, we have another clip from Senator Britt's response. When I took office, I took a different approach. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. The cartels put her on a mattress in a shoebox of a room, and they sent men through that door over and over again for hours and hours on end. We wouldn't be okay with this happening in a third world country. This is the United States of America, and it is past time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable, and the truth is it is almost entirely preventable. Uh, again, a lot to unpack in a very, uh, from a very short clip, but w the th when I heard this, the first thing that struck, that struck me is this story about this, um, this woman who was 12 and was sex trafficked and the way that Brit says, we wouldn't let this happen in a third world country. And this is the United States of America. The implication being, or the takeaway, the obvious takeaway of this being that this happened here on U.S. soil, and because she's talking about Biden and criticizing Biden, the, the obvious takeaway is that this happened during the Biden administration. But 
this the, it's very easy also to say that these facts don't add up uh and then like if one does a little bit more digging about this story which is true and by the way these things do happen south of the border routinely every day and things that if you can imagine things that are even worse than that uh but the way that she's playing this and uh the way that she's trying to make it like biden is allowing this absolutely grotesque horrific sex trafficking to go on your soil i think that it's just so dishonest and just playing to like you said the worst elements yeah i i think this as this is what fear-mongering looks like if you want to see it in its concrete form this is what it looks like and it's calculated it's calculated to do this so there's a way and it's it's completely dishonest but there's a way in which it's and the defense of it has been well she didn't say anything that was actually untrue she didn't actually say that it happened in america she implied it um and she didn't actually say that it happened during the biden administration though it that too is implied and so that that the response when and, and and this has got a lot of airplay about yeah but none of this is true the response is yeah but i didn't say that it happened in america and i didn't say it happened during biden's term. and that is if that's your response that's calculated that it's not oh my god i screwed up yeah you're right like this didn't happen in america and it didn't happen under it's like i shouldn't have brought up this example of what of the point i was trying to make it like that would have been oh, you might have some sympathy okay yeah you really screwed up in your response to the state of the union but that the response is no don't tell me that i said something that's not true because i didn't actually say this that's so part of it this as fear-mongering it's calculated fear-mongering and it's calculated in the details that are presented so you don't get the details like did this happen in america or not that's implied did it ha when did this happen during the biden administration it was actually during the george bush administration but it's you don't get any details like that you don't it's it's even in dispute and i went to read so some of the people track down who it is that she's referring to this person is an activist about trafficking um was was preyed upon when she was 12. she doesn't present it as it was the cartels so i well, i i got the transcript of her testimony to congress in 2050. she doesn't present it as it's the cartels it was um she was victimized by in effect like a child predator um uh and that's how and she calls him a pimp then he became but it is it's like somebody praying she was kicked out of her house and preying on a vulnerable young person it wasn't so even like that, that, so there's an implication. It's about, it's the cartels who I would not implicate. That's actually stated. That's not true. But the details you get is the, the, the horrors of what were, was done to her. And that's trying to activate, oh yeah. So I guess if we had more immigrants, like something like that would be happening all the time. In America. Like, and it's, it's so, if you'd stop to think about it for a minute or two, it like what is being said here so it's we wouldn't accept this in a third world country and this is the united states of america it, so is it what's being said america has to go and take on the cartels because we wouldn't accept this going on in other countries and third, but it is going on in other countries so it, like is the implication that that we should take out the cartels or um is the if if you think of it as like, like this is what happens in third world countries it shouldn't happen in america that's an argument and if you had any if you weren't just using this person for political scoring political points if you had any sympathy to this person it would be yeah like this is a reason we should have asylum in the united if someone wanting to flee that kind of life or at least or you think of parents of like i'm worried that this is going to happen to my kids if they stay in whatever Guatemala or under. And so I want to get to the United States. You, you should think, yeah, like I would do that as a parent if I, if I thought this might happen to my kids and so, and I would want the U S to be open to this. So the, the idea like this is that this, the implication is we we should close the border. Like, how does that help anything? Um, and, but that all of that's not thought about all that's thought about is like, here's a very disturbing incident 
And if I somehow put it as it's close to the issue of immigration and it's Biden's policy, that people will be so scared that they'll think, oh, yeah, I've got to support anybody. That I've got to support the person who's most anti-immigrant. And then it, she's trying to put it, well, that's Trump, not Biden. So if, if, and that, that's what fear mongering looks like. It, it, there's nothing serious about this as like you either care about the truth, you care about the person and the victim. It's all the score political points. And then I watched when she, so she was called out on this. And I, in, I looked at some of the more, the, when she's in a sympathetic arena. So when she was on Fox News and on a podcast with Ted Cruz, and there's no remorse. There's no remorse that it is, yeah, like th this, this, I should not have done this. Um, and that tells you something about the motivation here. So Onkar, circling back to where we started, kind of like what it looks like to take immigration policy seriously and to have a truly American immigration policy. Given what we just discussed, the fact that the Democrats are turning increasingly more anti-immigrant, where they're saying things and celebrating things that a year ago, two years ago, we would have never thought they would. And the, the Republicans are doing exactly this, what we were just discussing, the, the, all this fear mongering and all this very extreme anti-immigrant rhetoric and using facts in ways that are really dishonest to push that agenda. Essentially, they'll do anything, they'll do whatever it takes to push this agenda. Where do you think we stand? Like, is there any possibility of passing some legislation or trying to reform the system in a way that will be more pro-America, more like pro-work? I think there's some possibility. It's not very strong right now. And partly that it's, I mean, we can see that it just what happened in some of the elections in Ohio. Now it, it's the, so the Republican party used to be better on immigration. Um, and and that they thought of it as, yeah, we need we need to be more welcoming to people from around the world. That and that if we're supposed to be pro freedom and pro business, that's an aspect of it. And I can remember this in the the time of Reagan that there there's there was some real questioning and an attempt to move the Republican Party as. No, it, it, we should be on the side of peaceful, hardworking immigrants. And the party, because of Trump, is being pushed so much towards anti-immigration and anti-immigrant that it's hard to see in the, like, the real short term of something constructive happening in regard to immigration. And the fact that Biden, it's that oh, no, I've got to be the one who shows that I'm tough on immigrants and keeping immigrants out suggests that we're not going to get anything that will be very good. But I, as I said, I, do, I don't think the politicians reflect the actual views and attitudes towards immigrants of Americans when they're dealing with as individuals and with other people as individuals. And in that sense, there is... The, there is the possibility for better for politicians who are better on immigration and more American on immigration to actually gain political support. What's very difficult is to get out of the primary, particularly for the Republicans, to get out of the primaries, which is pushing so much towards the pro-Trump candidates. But it, it, in the, I mean, we're a few months away from the presidential election. If Trump loses again, it's possible that there will be some pushback in the Republican Party that Trump has a base. Um, he appeals to that base. That's part of what's happening in the primaries. But he can't, th this doesn't have general support. And so we have to do something to not let the base dictate all the candidates. Um, and then we lose general election. So if that happens, I can imagine there's at least a real door open to like we used to be better on immigration. Maybe we need to to get back to some of that. And then you you could imagine something 
better happening in regard to some immigration reforms? Well, I certainly hope so, because one of the things that strike me the most about this that, that I'm worried about the most is these policies, like the, these politicians are shooting themselves in the foot or they're like America, let's say, is shooting itself in the foot with like by increasing restrictions and this rhetoric. A few years from now, we will look back and say, oh, my God, how did we let this happen? Like we look now in the in the 1900s, like all the early 1900s, all the restrictions in immigration that were like, we look at them and they're like obviously wrong and they obviously did a lot of damage to this country. I think we're going to look back a few years from now the same way, but the damage is not easily fixed or maybe it cannot even be fixed. Yeah, it's not encouraging in the short term. Yes. Uh, okay, so for our audience, if you want to uh, look for a little bit more, oh, actually, what we can, have said about. Yes, go ahead. Can I just say one other thing? So, the, another take. So, one takeaway is just thinking of the wide political scene. But the more personal takeaway is both sides are bad on immigration, um, and don't what don't feel the need to side with either side is one, but also recognize that in various ways, they're pushing Americans, so it includes all of us, that they're, the, the, poli the political debate is pushing us to be more tribal and more collectivistic. And that you, you have to have some kind of view of immigrants as a collective, like immigrants are good or immigrants are bad. No, um, you should be judging them as individuals the, the people who want to come here and work, so that's a good thing about them. The people who want to come and commit crimes, that's something really bad about them. And you don't have to have a view of, like, think well, all immigrants are good or all are bad and have this kind of collectivized perspective that the political system is pushing. And, and because it's using so much fear mongering, everybody's susceptible to that. Like, you have to work to not let that um, affect you that to recognize, yeah, this is just fear mongering. I can simultaneously think the uh, uh, a murder of an American citizen by an illegal, that's really bad, and not be anti-immigrant as a result of that. But you have to work to not be pushed in the way that the political system is pushing us. And um, it takes real work, but it's, po it's possible. And you should do that work and not allow the, these political leaders to so infect your view of individuals as individuals. I think that's a that's a great remark, Onkar. It is so hard to think independently sometimes when there's all this noise around, especially this debate. So I think that's helpful for our audience. And if our audience wants to find uh, more information of like more things that, that we have said about immigration, uh, you can look in our YouTube channel, just search immigration, and uh, you will find some of the podcasts we've done in the past, including the one that uh, Onka referenced earlier. And if you have, um, we're doing a Q&A, a special podcast for Q&A, uh, podcast about uh, objectivism questions that you may have, you can send us an email to expert, experts at einrand.org, and we will um, answer those questions in a future episode. And as usual, if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube or whatever you're listening to this podcast and uh, click the bell to get notifications for when we go live or post new videos. And if you have any questions or comments about today's episode or you have suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at uh, newideal at einrand.org. We read all of your emails and we reply to many of them. So, Onkar, thank you very much for this discussion, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Christina.